Thank you to Sir John Oldham. <laughs> He's given some great feedback, and it's really it's been a really exciting morning for all of us, I think. Um, my next team that I really want to thank are my North team, um, the Integrated Care team. I want everyone to give them a really big round of applause because they've been fantastic. <laughs> I'm not making you stand up. <laughs> so these are the people who are making it happen in the North, and I just want to share a couple of um, quick stories, and then there's a video that we're going to watch. Um, there's been a few questions, specific questions, about how this works in practice. Well, the afternoon session after this, we'll be looking into how is this going to look for all of you as it's rolled out. Now, the West have got their team up and running over the last few weeks, which has been a really exciting time for all of us. And in the North, um, we started off in January with our first MDT meeting, where everyone sat nervously around the table and wondered what on earth we were doing. Um, and we generated a list using the Devon tool of our riskiest patients in Clipston. And there were lots of them. Um, and we all scratched our heads and started talking about these individuals. And I'd like to tell you about a lady called Pam. Um, she's told me I can use her name. She was Mrs. X, but that just sounds a little bit weird. Pam's risk of a readmission or some sort of crisis happening in the next 12 months was 97.8% um, when we first looked at her. I'd been looking after her for the last three or four years. She's got complicated health needs complex lung disease, heart disease, Addison's, and myself and Lisa, the community matron, have been visiting her regularly, trying to help keep this lady out of hospital. She was in hospital every few weeks. She'd be in for maybe a month or just a week, and two or three weeks later, she'd be back in hospital again with pneumonia or with just general respiratory difficulty, her Addison's playing up. Who knows what? She was in and out of hospital. Every winter for the last four years, she's had pneumonia three or four times, needing hospital admission every time. And when we first discussed her, I do think we all sort of went, ooh, what do we do? But gradually, there were little bits of, oh, I wonder if she needs work with her anxiety. Maybe we can do some work around her chest, physio, her coughing, what's her breathing like? And gradually, the, the picture sort of came together that, Working together as a team, we could help this lady. Her risk score now is really low. Um, it had dropped down to 73%. It's now almost not even, we can't even see her on the risk register. But we know she needs ongoing input, and she is getting that. But this lady has not been in hospital for months. She has had infections and exacerbations. She has been unwell. But instead of having to dial 999, she's been calling the right person at the right time. Um, she's using a cough assist machine. I have no idea what one of those is. She could beat me around the head with it. I still wouldn't know what it was, but it seems to help her. She's calling the right person when she needs to. I had a phone call from her last week. The community matron had been around in the morning and she'd felt fine. But about 10 hours later, she was feeling unwell. She had a fever. She was coughing mucky sputum. She couldn't breathe very well. And I was able to give her a prescription. That's her self-management coming in, recognising her illness and asking for help when she needs it. A few months ago, she didn't know what to do. I asked her what the difference was. Well, what's changed? Well, before, it was just you and Lisa. But now I know you've got a team. I didn't want to bother you before, because I know how busy you are. But now that you've got a team, I feel I can ring you up. I feel I can ask for help when I need it. I feel confident. I feel determined to go on. And that's just one of the 38 patients on the North Ward at the moment. And there are some who've been discharged, they're doing so well. They're not being not looked after, but they're being looked after by the wider integrated care team, not the sort of intensive care virtual ward. And this is an ongoing process, and more and more patients are being flagged up. So John mentioned that we already think we know which patients should be being looked at, but I am surprised every MDT meeting we have, there are names on that list who I don't even know. Why are they on the list? And you do a dig down, you look at their records, and you work out, actually, they're there, and we need to look after them. And those patients are not on our radars, and they're the ones where we can do the most good, because actually, they don't even know it themselves, but they're actually running into difficulty. I could tell you a dozen more stories, and I know that my team here, they could tell you dozens of stories themselves, and they've done such a good job, and working in a new way has been a bit weird, a bit difficult. We've had to learn things as we go along but it's been really, really rewarding. I'm going to show you um, a video now, I think. Um, 
I hope it puts it into context, not just my story, but the story of the team and the story of our patients. And then I'm willing to take any questions and things afterwards. One of the barriers initially was just literally getting to know one another and working out who does what and who can do what. Um, but from what I know Lisa's told me and from the meetings that we've had, the really, the big change has been working in a room together and meeting up regularly every day, getting, having those little conversations, not just the big MDT meeting, but the little conversations that lead to um, that kind of moment of inspiration of, I think we could do this for this person, and then putting that into practice. And I tell you what, when you're in the MDT meeting and, I, and we have this combined knowledge, it's extremely humbling. As a GP, I'd like to think I know everything, but I really, really don't. And there are amazing things that this team have done already in just the few short months that they've been up and running. And I, and I just know that there's more to come um, for all of these patients. Um, other barriers have probably been getting hold of GPs when they need to, um, but that's something that we're working on. And what I would actually encourage, because there's the West team has now started just for a few weeks now, and the Newark side team is starting in a few weeks' time. I would encourage you to, within your teams, talk about how how is it working, what's what's going well, what's not going so well, and. I would encourage you to try and make changes. If something isn't working, don't live with it, change it. Be flexible. And that's what we've discovered, is that we need to be flexible. We were holding our MDT meetings on completely the wrong day because the, the Devon tool software wasn't updated until the day after our meetings. Well, that's no good. So we've changed when our meetings happen. Um, even if it's something little, if you see something that isn't working very well, do talk to someone about changing the way it's done. Don't just stick with something that's broken. You know. um, the MDT meetings are monthly and there's a, well it was sort of a les, but it won't be a les, it'll be part of the um, quiz for general practice. Um, and so we meet monthly and, the, and practices are reimbursed and the time for their GPs to attend, nurses to attend, admin staff to attend. Because we acknowledge that doing something new initially is adding into what you're trying to do each day as it is and that time needs to be released or at least reimbursed for within practices. Um, our meetings last about an hour. I probably do about an hour's prep before each meeting where I look through the risk tool myself, identify which patients are going to need discussion. It actually makes the meeting run much more smoothly if someone's done a bit of prep beforehand, um, rather than in the meeting with everyone there trying to rifle through notes and work out who, who is who and what's going on there. Um, but actually, having that hour-long meeting once a month radically changes the way you look after your patients the rest of the time. And I can say from experience, my visits have gone down. My phone consultations with certain patients have increased, but at the right time and about the right thing and about the thing that's pertinent to them, asking the question, well, what do you want, actually gives a whole host of answers that I would never have really thought of before. Patients are telling me, I'd like to go out dancing <coughs> once a week. And I go, well, I don't know how to make that happen, but I know someone who does. And Judith comes along and says, actually, there's a group that this person could go to, or we can arrange transport for that to happen. And actually, things like that. I don't know how to arrange dancing once a week for someone who's got, you know, osteoarthritis, but I know a lady who does. And it might sound crazy, but those things reduce hospital admissions and 999 calls. And, and I think... The way to see this is a starting point for looking at those patients who are already at high risk, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and we, and what, what it does, though, is enables us to free up time within our resources to actually start embedding self-care, um, patient at the heart of care, um, planning and preventing crisis for all of our patients with long-term conditions. I know we are focusing very much on those highest risk patients, um, but having a virtual ward team as part of a larger integrated care team does actually free up um, GP time, practice nurse time, community nursing time to focus on all of the patients 
um, in our 20% of the population have one or more long-term conditions. We are aiming to look at all, all of those patients. And then beyond that, into disease prevention, working with public health and, and sort of you know, starting from early years onwards, trying to prevent disease in the first place. Just from this, the few months that this has been running up in the north, um, we've only got anecdotal evidence at the moment, but we are going to be measuring outcomes and, and looking at the effect that having this larger team has on primary care. Um, but it changes the way that you think about all of the patients that you come into contact with, um, not just those who are the riskiest, but everyone who's got a long-term condition. Now in my head, I'm working out where they fit on that spectrum of care and thinking, okay, they're not on the virtual ward, but where are they right now and what can I do? Who can I help draw in for this person who I've got in front of me? And it really does actually start to, to widen how we work for all of our patients.